that I'm not crying for my parents. I'm crying for those who are going to lose their life in this war. We must stop the war. I got to tell you, it's getting tougher and tougher to intro these videos because there is so much going on right now in Israel and Gaza that it's impossible to summarize all I want to talk about in an intro. But there's a lot I'm going to get to, including a recent statement from President Joe Biden mentioning occupation. Also, is MSNBC silencing their Muslim hosts? We'll get to that later. As well as comments from the South African president. Very interesting, if you have not been following their position on this, as well as uh, some other stuff. So let me first start with this. This is a BBC News presenter, uh, Helena Humphrey, and here she is interviewing a man who lost his parents, uh, sorry, an Israeli man who lost his parents in uh, the attack uh, by Hamas. And here is what he had to say. As you know, we've got a situation in which Israel is preparing for a ground offensive going into Gaza. What are your thoughts on the military response that we've seen from Israel this past week? Elena, I must tell you that I'm not crying for my parents. I'm crying for those who are going to lose their life in this war. We must stop the war. The war is not the answer. And I, I beg you, I beg all the viewers and listeners to do everything in, the, in, your, in, their, in your power to put pressure over, over everyone that is relevant to stop the war immediately, to freeze the situation. In our family, we are not seeking revenge. Revenge, revenge will just lead to, another, to more suffering and to more casualties. And even though it's the most horrible day, it was the most horrible uh, loss in, in, civil, in, uh, in lives in Israel since the uh, foundation of the country, I'm, I'm afraid that the numbers can be much bigger, an enormous number, and we must do everything to stop the war. And I'm, I'm afraid for the soldiers, for the civilians from both sides in the Gaza, from Gaza and in Israel that will pay uh, in their life. And this is why I'm crying. And this is why it was so important to me in this very hard time to go, to go with, uh, interview on this interview and to cry to the world. Stop the war. Please just stop the war. This man just lost his parents in an attack by Hamas. And his message is he does not want revenge. He does not want this war. He does not want a ground invasion of Gaza. He's able to see, despite the moment he's in, the feelings he must be feeling, he's able to separate that moment from the reality of what revenge or a ground invasion would mean. And it's it's important to show messages like this because you're seeing a very different message put out by media in the West, be it in the US, in the UK, in, in Canada, that is trying to justify what Israel's reaction to Hamas's attack is. Yet, I showed this in a previous video, but I'm going to keep showing it until there's new polling out uh, from the Jerusalem Post here. Israelis blame the government. For Hamas's massacre, say Netanyahu must resign. An overwhelming majority of 86% of respondents, including 79% of coalition supporters, said the surprise attack from Gaza is a failure of the country's leadership. Because Israelis understand what's going on here. They're the closest to it. In, a, in the podcast last week, the Leftist Mafia podcast, Matt Binder brought up how Netanyahu, think of him as he's the Trump of Israel. So if you're siding with how Israel's reacting to the attack on Israelis by all this bombing, this potential ground invasion, you are siding with the Trump of Israel. Clearly, people that live there do not support Netanyahu and his extremism. And yeah, to be clear, that at this point in time, there really isn't a great choice for uh, Israelis, 
a lot the vast majority of them from what i am reading are in support of the continued occupation of palestinians but there are still varying degrees there so when you have this ground invasion it's look we're gonna have to wait to see polling on that and the support that that may or may not have but it appears that they would not support him or support that move based on their level of support or lack thereof for Netanyahu. And uh, Mehdi Hassan tweeting out a post here from a veteran Israeli TV host uh, saying Netanyahu continues to face backlash inside of Israel. This veteran Israeli TV host says about the prime minister, quote, don't wait, put him on trial now. He is a war criminal. This is a much different message than what you are seeing in American media, in Canadian media. In fact, if you can almost, we'll get to this story later about MSNBC potentially maybe silencing some of their hosts. But if one of their hosts said this on air, called Netanyahu a war criminal, put him on trial now, do you think they'd be on air the next day? But in Israel, this is a common sentiment. So why is it so hard for the rest of the world, for the rest of the media, to acknowledge this? Bell True here, a uh, journalist for The Independent, their chief political or chief international correspondent, writing here, a UN official just told me civilians in Gaza are reduced to drinking seawater because clean water has run out. Body bags are running out. Fuel for hospital generators powering ventilators will run out in hours. Food supply low. The bombing is intensifying. There aren't words. It is just... It's impossible to imagine what life is like right now in Gaza. What civilians there are facing. As I've mentioned in other videos, 2.2 million people live in Gaza. It's an open-air prison. The border is controlled by Israel. There's one border with Egypt, but right now it's closed, often closed, even before this. Uh, and Israel was bombing that border anyways. There is no escape for people living there. And half of the population are children. Because of how terrible the situation is there. Again, lack of food. Even Again, even before this, because of the occupation, because of the blockade. Lack of food, lack of medicine, lack of clean water. Let me play this. NBC News can now report three convoys of what appear to be evacuees were just hit by Israeli strikes in Gaza. That's according to the Palestinian Health Ministry and also some of our own interviews. This morning, Israel dropped thousands of leaflets in the north of the Strip, warning civilians to go south. Quote, Gaza City has turned into a battlefield. Leave your homes immediately, read those flyers. The IDF told Gaza City residents they would refrain from touching an evacuation route until 8 p.m. That was just about two hours ago. So even if, they're, even if you're trying to leave, or at least leave the northern part of Gaza, where, they, where the Israeli government is apparently about to invade, even if you're leaving, you may get hit by an airstrike. This is a war crime. Like, the way we saw every single, you know, whether it's a sports team, a corporation come out saying, I stand with Israel. Maybe, maybe you should stand with civilians. Stand with people in the middle of this. Maybe you should stand against a government that has been occupying people for decades and are now killing the ones that are trying to escape Gaza, or at least northern Gaza. Not to mention the other you know, strikes before this. This isn't even just, you know, this isn't the first war crime that's happened here. We're talking about ongoing war crimes. It, it, the whole thing is just, it's so, this topic is so incredibly frustrating to me. Because of how uneven the coverage is. And because of how uneven the reaction is from even separate from media, but I think it's be largely because of media, but separate from media in the West. This, again, the reaction from like sport, uh, like hockey teams, NBA teams that are just completely, th there's of course no nuance at all. It's just, oh, we stand with Israel. You stand with Israel after they 
hit three convoys of, of civilians with airstrikes, you stand with Israel. You cannot equate the Israeli government with Jewish people. If you do that, you are being anti-Semitic, just as you cannot equate Hamas with Palestinians. You have to recognize here what is actually... if It's one thing if, if you're not going to say anything. If you're going to be... In, which When it comes to corporations, why the hell are, are sports teams... Just shut the f*** up. But if you're going to say something, then at the very least, be accurate. But they're not. Because they see the difference in blowback. If you come out in support of civilians in, in Gaza, you risk losing your job. There's one, there's one member of the NDP uh, in Ontario that came out in support of, uh, or not in support, but came out uh, acknowledging and, um, you know, recognizing the, the deaths on both sides, uh, civilian deaths in the Hamas, in the attack by Hamas, and then the reaction from the Israeli government, mentioned as well the occupation, the ongoing apartheid, and she was forced to retract that statement, forced to apologize. This is the, the so-called left wing in Ontario. One person in the so-called left-wing party came out and condemned what Israel has done, siding with human rights organizations like B'Tselem, an Israeli-based human rights organization, or Human Rights Watch, or Amnesty International, or the UN, siding with major human rights organizations. And she was forced to apologize for stating facts. This is why this is this entire topic is so frustrating because people's brains are fucking broken. Biden coming out over the weekend saying that the occupation the Israeli occupation of Gaza would be a big mistake. Now, I think he means he means specifically when it comes to a ground invasion. But they are already being occupied. They've been occupied since 1948. So we'll get to another Biden statement later on that is a little better, maybe. But, like, let's get with it. In 1948, Zionist military forces expelled at least 750,000 Palestinians and captured 78% of historic Palestine. The remaining 22% was divided into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So this is the start of all this. They've been occupied since 1948. And in terms of the human cost, between 2008 and 2021, the conflict has killed 23 Palestinians for each Israeli, According to the UN, these numbers are from 2021. I don't, you know, don't have updated figures here. But generally, when you have a power imbalance like this, when you have a government backed by the world's superpowers, and you have people being oppressed in an open air prison, this is generally what you're going to see. And just in terms of the daily life of Palestinians, not just in Gaza, this is now the West Bank. There are over 700 obstacles across the West Bank, including 140 checkpoints. These checkpoints severely limit Palestinian movement. About 70,000 Palestinians with Israeli work permits cross these checkpoints in their daily commute. And so this, I, I'm going to reference again, um, Michael Brooks in my video a week ago, how he discussed the obvious power imbalance, but also brought up this hypothetical. Imagine it were, it was uh, Jewish people that had to go through these checkpoints that were contained, whether it's in Gaza or being occupied in the West Bank. The world would not stand with that. It would be clear what the human rights violations are. Yet, when it's Muslims, when it's Palestinians, the world turns a blind eye. And just to give an idea, there's a great piece here um, going over 
the conditions at these checkpoints. So one example is, this is checkpoint 300. This is the main checkpoint for Palestinians working in East Jerusalem and other central cities. It blocks the road between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. It is estimated that 15,000 laborers cross through the checkpoint daily. So that's where it's located. Give an idea of the conditions here. This is daily for these people. It's not, you know, this is a one-off, even again, even if it was a one-off, it's, it's a problem. But this is their daily commute. Crammed into lines here. These checkpoints just to get to work. Quote, I left home at 4 a.m. Now it's 6.20 a.m. It will take another hour to cross the checkpoint. This is our life, difficult and full of problems. And again, this is the, 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 the West Bank where there is so-called more freedom. Gaza, forget about it. They're completely occupied. There's a blockade in place. But even where there is so-called, you know, more autonomy, this is their, their daily life. And to be clear on that, the checkpoints severely limit Palestinian freedom of movement, while Palestinians may have to wait for hours at these checkpoints and travel along segregated road networks. Israelis can travel freely on their own bypass roads, which have been built on Palestinian land to connect illegal Israeli settlements to major metropolitan areas inside of Israel. Just to give an idea of why this is apartheid. The very clear difference on how the two sides are treated here. As Amnesty International writes, our report reveals the true extent of Israel's apartheid regime. Whether they live in Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the rest of the West Bank, or Israel itself, Palestinians are treated as an inferior racial group and systematically deprived of their rights. We found that Israel's cruel policies of segregation, dispossession, and exclusion across all territories under its control clearly amount to apartheid. The international community has an obligation to act. And again, these similar statements have been put out by the Human Rights Watch, put out by the UN, put out by Israeli-based human rights organization, B'Tselem. This Anyone who is looking at this objectively can see what is going on here. Now, as well, this isn't the first time, by the way, that South African leader has come out to condemn the conditions that uh, Palestinians are living under, but this happened recently. South African president pledges solidarity with the Palestinians. Check out this video. We stand here because we are deeply concerned about the atrocities that are unfolding in the Middle East, and we have passed our condolences to the people of Israel as we are passing our condolences to the people of Palestine. They have been under occupation for almost 75 years. And people under occupation who have been waging a struggle against an oppressive government that has occupied their land, but also a government that has in recent times been dubbed an apartheid state. So there have been many rejections of the idea, including from people on the so-called left, that claim, well, what's happening to Palestinians can't be considered apartheid. It's, it's not at all like South African apartheid. Here you have one of many that have come out from South Africa, but here you have the South African president coming out and calling this apartheid. It's apartheid. I just showed you Amnesty International breaking down why it's apartheid. It's clear. I showed you the checkpoints. It's an occupation. It's segregation of people. It's different rights depending on who you are. It's apartheid. Now, I want to show you uh, Biden here on Twitter. And there's a reason I'm, you know, I otherwise wouldn't show this because it's a fairly innocuous tweet. But he's tweeting out here, we must not lose sight of the fact that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians had nothing to do with Hamas's appalling attacks and are suffering as a result of them. This is very incredibly obvious, shouldn't need to be said, but based on the president's previous responses and based on a lot of the what we're seeing out of politicians, out of the media, it is important to say this because this is not being said enough. That said, this fairly innocuous tweet got this reaction that is so absolutely ridiculous 
uh, here, saying, fact check, the majority of Palestinian people in Gaza elected Hamas, which ran in a kill all the, I probably can't say this on YouTube, platform, and it remains widely popular, uh, popular in Gaza. It's funny because then he was fact checked. <laughs> the last elections of Palestine were held in 2006. Nearly half of Palestinians are under 18 and were all either not alive in 2006 or could not vote. So this amounts to, someone replied here, Bruce Wilson, 7% of living Gazans voted for Hamas. Not to mention the other reason why this, this uh, thinking is broken from uh, Laura Friedman here. In 2006, Hamas didn't run on kill the blank platform. It ran as the party of change and reform on a platform boiling down to the other guys are corrupt and for 15 years achieved nothing. Time to throw them out. For most voters, a vote for Hamas was a vote against Fatah. So I've discussed this before, how Hamas has become more extreme as the years have uh, gone on. And so that you know goes to this point. But also worth mentioning here, Arguing that civilians are guilty because their government is guilty is literally the logic of terrorists, including those who have attacked the U.S. This is exactly right. So, like, <laughs> this clown, this clown supporting the very logic that terrorists use, the very logic that, by the way, Hamas used. Oh, they voted for, you know, Netanyahu, they voted for these governments. We're going to go and attack their civilians. So, do you support Hamas's logic? Because it appears you do. No civilians should be the target of anybody. Now, God, I gotta... I'm sorry, I can't go deep into this because I don't need to cry on camera. But the DOJ has opened a hate crimes investigation after a Muslim boy was stabbed to death by their landlord, who broke into their house, killed this six-year-old, and almost killed his mom. So, and while he was doing it, he apparently yelled, um, all Muslims must die. That's somewhere in this piece. But the, So it's now being investigated as a hate crime. This is why it is so important to speak out against the uneven coverage we are seeing. Let's end on this topic. Um, Alan writing here. Uh, so let me get to the, the actual piece, I believe, is, is this piece, but we'll get to that in a second. But um, saying if this were happening in China or another enemy country, it would make worldwide headlines. So apparently... We'll get to looking into this. MSNBC suspends Muslim anchors amid Israeli war uh, in, in Gaza. Now, Max Tanney is the one that wrote this for uh, uh, Semaphore. MSNBC has quietly taken three of its Muslim broadcasters out of the anchors chair since Hamas's attack on Israel. Now, there is a correction on this. Um, and again, these are user-generated corrections, so they're not, they're not always accurate, though often they are accurate. But uh, MSNBC is denying this, and I'll get to why. Uh, I mean, this is part of why. Ali Velshi has been on air. I showed a clip of, uh, he's been on the ground in Israel. So I showed a clip of him last week discussing how uh, Gazans can't leave, while Netanyahu is telling them to leave that they can't leave. So he was doing solid, accurate coverage from what I saw uh, from Israel. And uh, Eamon was on air on the 14th, so two days ago. So here he is hosting. So this doesn't appear to be true. Now, I have not seen Mehdi Hassan. Uh, apparently his show has been moved around but to, to have more live coverage, but apparently that's also the case for other shows on the network. So look, I don't know. It's possible. I, I, I'm not watching MSNBC 24-7 for obvious reasons. Uh, I don't watch that much cable news. But it's it's possible there maybe is some sidelining of certain perspectives. I know, you know, generally these perspectives are sidelined. Generally, you're not seeing the perspective of uh, Palestinians represented in, uh, in mainstream press. But from what I am seeing, I'm seeing a lot more examples 
of this sort of coverage, be it from um, Ali Velshi that I've showed you before, or Mehdi Hassan has been very good on this. I've seen a lot more of that than I have in the past. So I don't think MSNBC is silencing. We're gonna, ha I'm gonna have to wait. You know, obviously the, the jury isn't out on this, even though Eamon has been on there. We're gonna see going forward if Mehdi Hassan is is gonna be hosting again. But uh, from what I've seen, it has not been as bad as some are claiming. That said, it could always be better. There's, I have no issue with the initial criticism because this generally the coverage has not been great so if there's going to be pushback it's only going to help hopefully the uh the way this this is covered but i don't know i am i am uh not my usual self because of how depressing this entire story is but it's it's not even a fraction not even a tiny bit of what people are actually going through on the ground uh, in Gaza. And uh, let's also be clear, Israelis, uh, of course, are also fearful. So this is, I'm going to con continue covering this as long as I have something to say. As long as there are stories coming out of this, I'm going to keep covering it. Uh, yeah, at some point, I'm going to have to cover something else as well, because I just can't, I'm not going to be the channel that just covers this issue. But as as this is an ongoing uh pressing topic and there are things changing by the hour i'm going to continue covering this as long as i possibly can